Archaeological evidence suggests we once traveled together, sharing our urban transportation. Known as trolleys, trams, or streetcars, they served millions of people around the world. For a few pennies, anyone, even children, could go almost anywhere. We rode them to the beach on hot summer days, to the movies, to work and school, to the fair and back. In happy times and sad, they took us on the journey of our lives. But then they vanished, almost overnight their tracks paved over and wires torn down. They must have had powerful enemies because a great worldwide extinction ensued. But why? What happened? To investigate the tragic story behind the demise of the trolley, we would have to journey to a land where they somehow survived. The day begins at 5 a.m. at the Roncesvalle streetcar shops. and 50 streetcars, or red rockets as they are called here, to wash, inspect, buff and shine. They call this the beauty parlor. There are 780 specially trained motormen and women. difficult or awkward to drive, more like a lot of fun. Their power is drawn from above, perhaps their inspiration as well. Next stop, Humberloo. They appear to be a most ingenious invention floating gracefully on special rails laid into the street itself. They can't swerve all over the road like cars, so they're safe and predictable. As long as you don't try to cut them off. They may be artifacts from the past, but they're effective, charming, and extraordinarily clean. There is nothing that would justify their extermination, at least at first glance. Their earliest ancestors were neither clean nor electric when they began to appear more than 150 years ago. In the early 19th century, it was already well known that iron wheels running on rails created very little friction, allowing a single horse to pull great loads easily. By 1880, all around the world, billions of trips were being made in horse-powered trolleys along thousands of miles of track. but they were expensive to operate, and only the well-off could afford to use them.
Worse still, urban landscapes were becoming overwhelmed by mountains of manure produced on a daily basis. Experiments with coal-fired trams had predictable results. Coal-burning trains, factories and furnaces contributed to the misery with often lethal smog. Solving these problems would require radical innovation and a visionary like no other. Frank J. Sprague was an American naval officer and inventor who set out to improve upon early electric trolley systems. In 1887, he undertook to build a fully operational street railway system in the small city of Richmond, Virginia. His contract gave him only 90 days to get the 12 and a half mile system functioning perfectly. Electric trolleys had begun to run in other cities, but technical problems remained to be solved. Sprague's team developed a spring-loaded pole with a flanged guide wheel to keep it tight on the wire. Power flowed from the overhead line to the motors, with the wheels passing electric current to a safe, grounded rail. They designed a unique wheel assembly to carry the electric motors between spring-loaded axles, keeping them from rattling to pieces on Richmond's rough track. The combination of electric motor and steel wheels would set a standard for fast, energy-efficient transportation that was virtually impossible to beat. It was almost perfect. Those that had only known the speed of a horse could, for the first time, fly like the wind. Trolley systems multiplied, transforming urban landscapes across the continent and around the world. The lines made towns into cities, and cities without trolleys became hardly cities at all. I said I hoped I hadn't stepped upon her feet. I learned her name. By the early 20th century, a thousand trolley companies sold 14 billion tickets a year in the United States alone. Buzz, buzz, buzz went the buzzer. Mountains of manure and countless billions of flies disappeared from city streets. It was the first effective way to transport large numbers of people at low cost with no pollution whatsoever. Their low operating cost and energy efficiency made them egalitarian. Those who could not afford a horse and carriage could easily ride a trolley. Everyone could go everywhere, together. It's hard to imagine what would cause people to turn against the invention that saved their cities and enriched their lives. I can get the bathers. Bathers? Yeah, you're going in the right direction. I'll call, I'll call it out for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Tracks and intersections became engineering wonders of the age. The most impressive was the Grand Junction, where trolleys arriving from all directions could proceed anywhere, and they still do in Toronto. This is the action switch. That means if I see a switch that goes left or right, if I hit this button, it'll open automatically for me, so I don't have to get out. I can go down the street or up the street with this button here. There are 83 kilometers of track on 11 different routes with 685 stops. As lines were added, the city grew up around them. 300,000 passengers a day use the streetcars, 120 million trips a year. Perhaps the highest concentration of trolleys anywhere was in Brooklyn, New York, where their baseball team was named the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. Almost anyone could afford both the trolley and a baseball game, too. With few cars on the road and nothing to block their way, trolleys could move huge numbers of people for every possible kind of event. Political conventions, labor disputes, revolutions. The small four-wheel trolleys of the first generation were soon overwhelmed, victims of their own success. People couldn't get enough of this wonderful new invention and the freedom that went with it. It was clear by the beginning of the 20th century Engineering advances were needed to keep improving service and expanding ridership. The Transit Commissioner of Cleveland, Ohio, undertook major improvements in a second generation streetcar. They started with a clean slate, improving brakes, speed, capacity, ease of entry and exit. cars were faster and carried three times more people. Yet their energy efficiency was also increased. With a burst of electric power, the latest trolley could coast for miles. He named the new car Peter Witt after himself. This reincarnation would dramatically improve public transit across North America, at the same time helping to spread it through Europe and eventually the world. Training was more formal in Europe than America. Schools were set up for drivers and conductors. Motormen and conductors were regarded as important, even glamorous jobs. New ideas were introduced to improve the experience. In Britain, they sought to increase capacity in what were often very limited clearances. they became famous for their double-decker trams. Here, the main goal was not growth so much as improving transportation within century-old cities built for pedestrians and animal-powered traffic. Designed by painters, sculptors, and skilled architects, European squares, piazzas, and boulevards were laid out like canvases, where the tram was the perfect final brushstroke. 
There was something intangible about them too that defied easy explanation. An aura of romance, adventure, charm. Indeed, the trolley had powerful friends. But throughout the 1950s and 60s, they started to disappear here in Europe, although not to the same extent. The Europeans were understandably more reluctant to tear down their cities to build parking lots and freeways than was the case in North America. But as with Toronto, there were exceptions, including the Italian city of Milan. The American Peter Witt cars built under license by the Italians have run here for over a century. The land of Ferrari, Alfa Romeo, and Lamborghini understood something lost on many others. Traveling in style can be a destination in its own right. What could be more stylish than a century-old tram? We can only imagine who once rode these treasures and what spirits might haunt them still. A young Sophia Loren headed home after a screen test. A little Mussolini on a shopping trip with his mama. A young Ferrari clutching a toy car. Andretti, Fellini. Pavarotti as a boy going to his first opera. The trolley shaped the world in subtle ways long ago forgotten. But romance and style aside, it's the utility of this system that explains its longevity. The trams rarely share the road with the automobile. For nearly a hundred years, they have had their own right of way where cars aren't allowed to slow them down. With loving care, it's very likely these treasures will last another hundred years in Milan. Not so the case in Toronto, where they heroically toil under the toughest possible conditions. Trolleys were populist and democratic, and remain so. Their mission is to move anyone, anywhere. Immigrants often arrive with little money and depend on the streetcar networks to move freely about town, to connect with new opportunities, to build businesses and raise families. They give everyone a fair chance to live and work as they please to build a life.
Toronto, streetcars continue to help build an efficient, high-density urban environment, promoting a vibrant downtown. In the early days, a mule might have felt some resentment, but the trolley carried a greater load and clearly was not the one in the way. Even an ass would know that. At first, trolleys had the streets to themselves, but then a new machine, indeed a new philosophy, began to steal their right of way. The motor monkey, one newspaper called them, was a new form of life which came to believe it had a hundred times more rights than those sharing the trolley. A single car occupied nearly the same space as a hundred people riding in a trolley. Yet those one hundred people were soon accused of being in the way. Curious twist of democracy where all were equal, but those with a car were far more equal. As accidents increased, it was always the streetcar's fault, or so claimed the motorist. Even though the streetcars were on rails and driven by professionals, a showdown between sharing and selfishness was inevitable one that would have unimaginable consequences in the coming century. As the developed world became more and more congested, new opportunities emerged across the third world where transportation was less an expression of vanity and more about actually getting to work. Here, few could afford private cars, so with nothing in their way, trams moved large numbers of people quickly and efficiently. But here too, they were eventually forced off their tracks and into oblivion once again. With a few exceptions. The philosophy of sharing and frugality found sanctuary here in the once British colony of Hong Kong. Descendants of the jaunty English double-deckers remain a protected species after a century of continuous service. They worked through the First and Second World Wars, the Japanese invasion, the coming of Mao Zedong and communism. Throughout, they performed heroically and reliably. They may be charming tourist attractions, but they have survived here because they are practical and efficient. We can only imagine the chaos of seven million people trying to get by without them. The battle between the car and the streetcar raged throughout the 1920s until the crash of the New York Stock Exchange led to a worldwide depression. Few motorists could afford gasoline. Public transit was the only way to get around, though for many there was nowhere to go. The Depression encouraged shared transportation and economic frugality, and reminded some there was more to life than merely driving around. The once more equal found themselves to be just plain equal once again. War followed the Depression. Trolleys were called upon to recruit soldiers, 
Americans, Canadians, British, and Germans too. Precious oil was needed for the work of war. Tanks, battleships, bombers, and bombs required vast amounts of scarce petroleum. The hard-working, frugal trolleys ran on electricity made from almost anything. Locked in battle, the, the leftovers. Fighting for one great cause. Now the stage was set. They worked through the London Blitz. 45,000 tons of The fire bombing of Dresden. Now we saw the result. And what we saw... The service they provided was critical. Is the most staggering sight in the world. They paid the ultimate price the world over, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We are gathered here to conclude a solemn agreement whereby Peace may be restored. And of course, they were on hand to share in the victory celebrations in San Francisco. The trolley, having helped to win the war, might have imagined it would inherit the peace. A new generation of radically improved trolleys designed before the war was ready when peace finally came. They were called PCC cars and were regarded by many as the most beautiful of all. Mass produced on a production line, they borrowed every trick known to modern industry. They had more power and space. They could out-accelerate any motor car on the road, and their aerodynamic styling hinted at cities of the future. Tens of thousands were built for every city in North America and many around the world. We had within our grasp an elegant, nearly perfect solution to the complex problems of urban transportation and air pollution. We threw it all away in the blink of an eye. Within a few years, trolleys of all kinds were cut to pieces. Their rails torn up and their lines ripped down. Some were burned in huge funeral pyres. Others were herded together and marched like wounded elephants to a distant grave. The most efficient form of transportation ever devised would lose out to the most wasteful. General Motors, Firestone, and Standard Oil, among others, conspired to purchase and destroy streetcar systems throughout North America in order to monopolize transportation for their cars, buses, tires, and gasoline. They were convicted and fined $5,000. The Motoramic? Yes, the Motoramic Chevrolet. A new concept in low-cost cars. Thus began in earnest a new philosophy of self-absorption, the consequences of which were to prove catastrophic for urban environments, and eventually the planet itself. Rubber tires are essential to keep cars glued to the road, but the friction that make them controllable make them inefficient. To make even more room for private motoring, those willing to share their ride would be lured into tunnels of perpetual blackness. At unspeakable cost, the idea was to make public transit go away, so the motorists could enjoy the sunlight above.
with shared transportation, potentially carbon-free, a trolley of sorts, on a journey hardly worth taking. A trolley's worst nightmare, if such a thing were possible. By 1960, hundreds of cities worldwide had lost their electric public transit. In North America, Toronto continued almost alone for another 50 years. All this time, motorists never ceased badgering them off the road. Few considered what would happen if everyone had a car. Built in the 70s, each has at least 10 million kilometers in service. Worn out and trapped like everyone else, it's a miracle they've hung on. They hate these streetcars. They don't want these damn streetcars walking up. After 150 years of nonstop service, the days of the famous Red Rockets appeared for a time to be numbered. Their future hung on the thinnest of threads. It's hard to imagine this city without streetcars. Who will take us to work and to school? To ball games on warm summer nights and skating in winter. Who will take us to nightclubs, concerts and restaurants? And who will carry us safely home? Uh, <laughs> Do you know everyone's driver? Well, <laughs> we have each other at all times. Sometimes I don't know their names. We rid our streets of manure, of air pollution. They served us in depression, revolution, and war. The trolleys that had once saved our cities, then hung on for dear life, would now be confined to the sidelines as witness to the final act of civilization. The forces of endless combustion and mindless gridlock had won the hearts and minds of all. There are now a billion cars on the road, plans for billions more. A hundred million barrels of fossil fuel are burned into the atmosphere every day. As warming continues, seas rise and become more and more acidic. Who could have imagined the sad fate of humanity that now lies ahead? The effects of CO2 grow more critical by the hour. Polar caps melt. Forest fires rage ever more lethal. Storms increase in ferocity. As the clock struck midnight, a most unexpected twist occurred. trolley may have drawn its power from above just one last time. Another reincarnation ensued. With all the latest advanced technology, automotive, aviation, space, high-performance motors, articulation, regenerative braking. Sprague would have hardly recognized this dazzling new world of innovation. What he would recall, however, is the physics, the steel upon steel, the power
power from above. The sharing of one's ride. Coupled together, it could move a thousand people with extraordinary efficiency and a carbon-free footprint. Someone came up with an entirely new name, Light Rail. It has been half a century since the last new trolley poked its head from a factory door. It would have to draw from every possible advantage. After all, something once hunted down and systematically exterminated could not expect everyone to welcome its return. Best to tiptoe back into human consciousness hardly noticed at first. built hundreds of years ago. Not as parking spots, but gathering places for human beings. A miraculous rediscovery ensued. With sensible transportation, there would be room for much more important things. But most important was something intangible, the spirit of the trolley. The fairy tale sense of adventure and enchantment would somehow have to be reignited. Most important is the ride itself. Will it be a wonderful experience? The ride of a lifetime. What if, around every corner, there was nothing to block our way? What if the future was a trip worth taking? Efficiency coupled with zero emissions makes electric rail thousands of times less damaging to the environment. Major advances in wind, sun, and hydro all produce zero emissions in the form of electric power. One form of transportation uses electricity with supreme efficiency. Steel wheels, electric motors, shared transportation, power from above. One device perfectly suited to save the world.
thousands of miles of new rail lines are growing across Europe, Asia, and America. Much of it on right of way, once ruled by the original tram systems. And what about the city, loyal to its streetcars throughout the great extinction? A land where time stood still and people kept moving. Here, the trolley has always been much more than an invention. It is a way of life, a state of mind. Right, you. Get They gather to celebrate one of the longest continuous trolley services in all the world and the newest member of the Red Rocket family. The trolley had the best possible friends all along, those willing to share. The future of the world will depend on this state of mind and on a new generation of warriors. It will be a long and difficult fight for those willing to share their ride and build a decent future together. The trolley that saves the world is the one we choose to ride. The choice is ours. It always has been. Thank you.